Now you might have, when you saw the title for today, Lessons in Restoration Ecology, you might have been thinking, Dave, you must be crazy. Why in the world are you gonna give us a science lesson on today of all days? And I promise that that's not what I'm gonna do. But you may have been thinking to yourself, that is one of the most out of touch white men in the history of all <laughs> out of touch white men to be picking that topic for this day. But bear with me for a bit while I walk you through my thinking and why I thought this might be worthwhile to spend just a little bit of time reflecting on today. I've been reading a lot about democracy lately, not just since the election, but prior and the weeks prior and the weeks prior to that, um, and pulling out some of my old books that I hadn't read for a while. And one of them uh, is this book that's called Gardens of Democracy, and I brought a copy with me, actually. It's this short little book, Gardens of Democracy, by, by um, Eric. I, I don't know how to pronounce Eric's last name, so I'm going to skip that for now. But um, what the author is saying in this short little book, and there's lots in it that, like with everything, you know, I don't agree with everything, but I like the original idea. Um, what he's saying is that, you know, often we think of democracy and, and our politics as this machine. You set the machine up and it goes in motion and from time to time it starts to, to break down and you call on the mechanic to fix it and then you just let it run again. And he said that model really is not what's true and what's happening. That it's much more like a garden than a machine. Um, and that thinking of it a machine is one of the things that keeps us from tending to it in the way that we need to. That if you think about it as a garden, a garden is something that needs constant tending, constant nurturing, constant watering, bringing in new seeds, things that happen throughout the year, throughout the seasons. And that it's not just one garden, it's many gardens. It's a linkage of gardens and of ecosystems. Um, and so I had been thinking about that. I had been thinking about those words. And one of the things that the author doesn't necessarily talk about, though, is what happens when those ecosystems are degraded. And that's what got me starting to think about restoration ecology, because restoration ecology, different from conservation, conservation identifies a beautiful space that needs to be conserved and figures out how to protect it. Restoration ecology takes areas that are damaged and neglected and have become environmentally um, unhealthy and figure out how can we restore health? How can we help this ecosystem become vibrant? Um, and I started thinking about it more, even more when, as I was going through different readings, I came across this article, and it was one I had not read before. And it threw out a term that I hadn't heard before um, anocracy, which I had not heard before. Anocracy is a term. And what anocracy is, it's a term that sociologists use for a government or a country that is not fully a democracy and not fully an autocracy. It has a blend of both. Um, and this article was written before the election, but was talking about the ways that our democracy over time has become downgraded and degraded, and that really where we were was in a state of anocracy, a blend of democracy and autocracy. Sometimes countries go through that if they're um, a autocracy that's moving towards democracy, they go through this blend, and sometimes countries go through it when they're moving more and more towards autocracy. And it shook me, it shook me because when I read it I went, man, 
that seems really where we're at. And this, is, this was before the current election. So I don't know that the current election changed where we're at. It just made that space more visible, that we're in this space of democracy or, and anocracy, you know, anocracy, that blend of the two. And so what do we learn from habitat restoration of uh, helping nurture degraded ecosystems that might be relevant for this moment in time and might be relevant for us um, individually and as people? And I'm going to try to keep an eye on, on time. Um, I know we're already a little, a, a little over. Um, but I do want to just share with you um, a piece, a person. When I think about um, habitat restoration, the person who inspired me the most is this man, his name is Michael Howard, and he lives in the Fuller Park neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. And um, Michael and his wife Amelia and their family um, were community organizers with a lot of different issues, but weren't necessarily environmentalists per se. But they lived right next door to an illegal garbage site, um, a two-story high illegal garbage site in their, in their neighborhood. And so as they were trying to organize things, the neighbors would say, what are you doing about this? And so the shorthand version of the story is that they organized the neighborhood, cleared out the garbage, planted a prairie, and then bought actually a, an old beaten down warehouse a couple blocks away, turned the parking lot into a farm, turned some of the inside of the warehouse into a space that, that um, grows microgreens. And um, I had the opportunity not only to meet Michael, but work alongside him for many, many years. I volunteered uh, there at Eden Place for, for over um, a decade. And there were a couple of things that I, that I learned about what they had done. And one, and these are just different principles of, of restoration ecology, and one piece is, is figuring out how do you either stop or reduce the harm, even if you can't eliminate it completely, right? What do we do? What kind of barrier do we set up? For them, when they, when they first started trying to clear out that garbage, um, I remember talking to his son, Troy, because he was a, a young, young boy when they started this, and at the time that I met him and was talking with him, he, he was a young man still very involved in the process. And he says, I remember going out there, and we would spend hours and hours and hours bagging up garbage and clearing it out, and then during the night, more garbage would show up, and we were right back where we started, and that it was just heartbreaking to walk out there and see that garbage still there. So they erected some barriers so that the trucks couldn't get through and they could start making some progress. There's an author, Timothy Snyder, who's a historian who writes on fascism and tyranny and wrote um, this book called On Tyranny and 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. Again, a book that was written long before um, either of the, the, the elections that we've had most recently. And one of his, le his first lesson um, is says, um, don't concede early, or don't concede. You know, the importance of not uh, sticking with your, who you are. Um, uh, I ha originally, I thought I might invite Dave to tell the, the story, but um, we're, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna shorthand it. <laughs> but when we were here Thursday night, um, Dave Dreyer told a story about um, uh, a man who would light a candle um, and pray, and one of his friends said, why do you light that candle? That's not going to change the world. And his response in the story was, I don't light the candle to change the world, I light the candle to keep the world from changing me. And then Dave said, that's why I'm thinking about church right now. This is where I come to keep the world from changing me. And um, the author, Timothy Snyder, talks about that, the importance of maintaining our values, our principles, not just us as, as you use, but, but folks who have values and principles that bring justice into the world and bring democracy into the world. The other is the importance of nurturing health where you can find it. 
you know, what are those, what are those wellsprings? Um, where are the things that are, that are healthy? You know, so for, for Michael and the folks at, at Eden Place, um, it was um, planting a, a, a prairie in the soil that was able to sustain it. And in the places where the so because it was very lead poisoned soil, so they couldn't grow food. Um, so they created raised beds for growing food, um, but they could plant the, 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 the prairie directly into the soil that existed, right? Um, and so there is a, there, the author that I just mentioned, um, uh, Timothy Snyder, he was on with Ali Velshi yesterday and had this great interview with Ali Velshi. And I posted it in our internal Facebook page. And one of the things that he said in that interview was that importance of creating wellsprings, that often we, we think about, well, what are the guardrails? This is kind of paraphrasing what he said. What are the guardrails? What are the guardrails? And rather than thinking about how do we build guardrails, how do we build wellsprings where healthy things are happening that are counter to what is trying to be created? And the last one is linkages and connections. Um, there's this wonderful um, ecological restoration project that I love that's called Yellowstone to, Yukon to Yellowstone, where they figured that bears uh, need large migration spaces. And all of the spaces where bears are are all fractured and fragmented and separated from each other. So they started developing linkages so that the bears could get from one habitat to the next. They didn't have to restore the whole thing back to where it was before all the highways went in and before civilization came, but creating those linkages. What are our linkages? You know, for Eden Place, it wasn't just about the linkages they created with the land, it was the linkages that developed between people. I remember one day when I was there, um, an elderly um, black man who came in his full suit, um, clearly wasn't there to uh, dig in the dirt, um, but came and walked around and was talking to people one by one, and he came up to me and he said, I want you to know what a blessing this place is to our neighborhood. And I lift that story for us to think, what do we do to become a blessing for the neighborhood? What is the wellspring that we can create? I believe that our church is more important now than ever. That our connections and our relationships with other people are more important now than ever. And the ways that we connect to other churches and other organizations is more important now than ever. What is the ecosystem that we'll be part of creating? Amen, Ashe, blessed be.